say that I'm honored um, uh, to um, host and to talk to Paul Castor, Holocaust survivor. Uh, just a brief um, uh, few lines about Paul. He uh, was born in 1925 in Germany, where uh, when he was seven years old, Hitler came to power, which changed the course of every, his, his everyday life for him and his family. And we'll talk about Paul surviving the Holocaust and obviously uh, how music, classical music, is a big part of your life and basically saved your life as well. Uh, but before, before that, I would like to say that um, we can have this talk thank to the American Society for Yad Vashem <clears throat> that supports the crucial efforts of Yad Vashem, the World Holocaust Remembrance Center in Jerusalem. And for more information, uh, we can all visit their page in Yad Vashem USA. So, um, Paul, please um, take me back to the early years when you were a kid. Um, tell us, bring us into your life in Germany and how everything started. Well, my earliest memories go back to the late 1920s. I was three or four or five years old. Uh, those were... Paul, if, we, if you can only just look, at, look up. Yes. Camera, this, this, this way, yeah, exactly. So we can see you um, and that's, that's how we can actually okay. see you. Yeah. And um, what I remember in those early years, were, was that there was economic and political unrest. There were signs all over town, uh, propaganda for different parties. And um, there were the socialists, the communists, the conservatives, the Nazis, trying to make propaganda so that their representatives would get elected. And uh, but what suddenly changed in 1933, when I was seven years old, was all that former propaganda, all those former signs and uh, displays had vanished. Now there was only the red flag of the Nazis, the pictures of the Nazi leaders, and there were big signs, and I could already read, that declared, the Jews are our misfortune. The Jews are criminals, the Jews are thieves, the Jews are guilty that we lost the First World War. And that was difficult for me to understand. My family, parents, grandparents, and I had a two-year-older sister, I knew they were no criminals. Oh, my, we had a large family of uncles and aunts and cousins and, and Jewish friends of the family. And I knew that none of those fitted the description by the Nazis on their big signs all over town. It was my first exposure to um, state controlled uh, description of facts, stated as facts, which did not, were not supported by what I knew as a child. Well, I had started school in 1932, the four year elementary school. In those days, boys and girls had went to separate schools. I lived in a town called Wiesbaden in West Germany near Frankfurt. And in the class that, where I, that I attended, I was the only Jewish boy, but it made no difference. I was one of 35 other kids. I was not harassed. I was not uh, called bad names or anything like that. My early 
years during the Nazi regime, uh, I had not, I was not ex exposed to any obvious uh, mistreatment or uh, being called names. It was for me a happy childhood, but it was different for the adults. People in official positions, lawyers, government, Jewish lawyers, Jewish uh, people working for in the administ administration were uh, could no longer exercise their professions. And not knowing what was going to happen, uh, the Jews started talk about emigration. Now in Wiesbaden, there was a Jewish population of about 3,000 in a town of 300,000 citizens. Uh, in all of Germany in 1933, when Hitler came to power, there were about 600,000 Jews in a population of 65 million. So overall, the Jews made up barely 1%. And again, uh, this harassment, this ideology of anti-Semitism, of, of trying to minimize the, inf the uh, or make the lives of Jews miserable, it just didn't make sense. But younger people, I had a couple of cousins in the early 20s, one could no longer attend university, the other was uh, had difficulties in a business career. Uh, they were unattached and they just left and moved to then Palestine. And in retrospect, they made the right decision. Life went on for us. In 1936, I had finished four years of elementary school. And it was now a question, should I continue to attend high school? I was a good student. And yes, my father wanted to make sure that I had the best available uh, schooling. And there were three, in Wiesbaden, there were three boys, what there was called gymnasium, boys high schools. So he went with me to the one that was nearby to enroll me. But the principal told my father, our school is 100% Nazi. We do not assume any responsibility for the safety of your child. That was effectively a no. The second school had some other excuse. The third school did accept me. And, and also my best friend, uh, Leo Kahn. So we, now we were two boys in a class again of about 30, 35 students, two Jewish boys. And in, I started there in 1936. It was a, a uh, <clears throat> 10 years old. Academic requirements were quite demanding. We started out with Latin and math and other school subjects. And also physical education was uh, quite uh, important and one of the uh, main subjects. And again, both Leo and I, we could easily meet the requirements. We belonged to a Jewish sports club. And we were good students, and neither teachers nor the other boys in the class or in the school were made our lives difficult just because we were Jews. I went to that school. I started in 1936, and it so happened that for restrictions.
questions became more more important, more uh, harassment. I mean, for Jews to to exercise their professions to run their businesses were slowly but surely made much more difficult, if not impossible. My family tried to get a sponsorship by some relatives we had in New York uh, to uh, possibly emigrate to the United States. For that, the relatives had to provide affidavits of support. Otherwise, you would not get a visa to come to this country. And these relatives said, we cannot sponsor the whole family, but we are willing to take one of the children. Uh, my sister being the older one, she was two years older. Now, in June of 1938, at the age of 14, was the one to leave her home. Our mother took us still to Hamburg to put her on a boat in those days one didn't fly. And off she sailed to New York to a safer and secure environment, but without the support and the love of parents and family. My life continued that year. I still attended uh, vacation. I went, always went to the countryside where the family had relatives. And in August, I came back to be um, again, resumed school and social activities. We were not uh, part of social activities with other school kids. They belonged to the Hitler youth. But my friend Leo and I uh, were members of the Jewish sports club and J Jewish social clubs and activities that the small community of Jews in Wiesbaden provided for their children. Let's go on to a few months to its late 1938 to November of that year. Leo and I were in school, in class, attending a lecture when an administrator from the school came in, into the classroom and said, uh, you two boys better go home. There's trouble in town. Well, we were told to go home and that's what we did. When I came home, I found my mother and grandmother. My grandmother lived with us. My grandfather had died a couple of years earlier. They were rather upset. They, when they wanted to go to, to our store, uh, a walk of about 20 minutes, to get there, they had to pass the large synagogue of Wiesbaden. When they approached it, they saw it was in flames and they noticed that some Jewish stores on their way were being vandalized and destroyed by German population. My father had gone earlier to open the store. He found that a large crowd of people were in front, basically uh, engaged in smashing large display windows, large glass fixtures and shelves where merchandise was kept. That destruction went on undisturbed. The two policemen who were watching did not interfere, but told my father to come with them. Fighting their way through the crowds, my father could sidestep and get away from the policemen and somehow found out that Jewish men were being arrested and he went into hiding. What happened that day? 
in Germany, all synagogues throughout Germany were burned or destroyed. All still existing Jewish businesses were vandalized and destroyed. All Jewish men at the age of between 16 and 65 were arrested and sent to concentration camps. It came unexpected and but well organized. It obviously was now a sign that this was the end, the beginning of the end for Jews in Germany and ultimately for Jews in Europe. There was not, no longer a question, should we emigrate? All what can think of is we have to get out to save our lives. But no country would take us. Well, Leo, my friend Leo and I, next day went back to school, but we were called to the principal's office and told that from now on, no Jewish children were allowed to attend German schools anymore. Well, being 12 years old, a first vacation can be accepted. So I came home and that evening, you know, that day, my father came back because we learned that supposedly the arrests of the men had been concluded. Here the family was back in our apartment and at eight or nine o'clock in the evening, the doorbell rings. I open the door and a man in civilian clothing identifies himself as a member of the secret police, the Gestapo, and orders my father to come with him. Within minutes, my father is gone. My mother quickly tells me, get on your bike and go to friend's house, a house where our friends lived, warn them that the arrests are still going on. It was a dismal November night. It was a task that I still remember. The next day, my mother and I go to the police. Where is my father? No answer. A few days later, we find out that he, with so many other Jewish men had been sent to the concentration camp of Dachau, a concentration camp that existed until it was liberated by American troops by the end, at the end of World War II in the spring of 1945. What's going to happen to the men? We get bad news. We learn that a cousin of mine in his early 20s, he had been sent to Buchenwald, another concentration camp, and had died there. Later, we found out that he actually had been beaten to death by the Nazi guards. Other relatives or friends learned that the husband or their father or their brother or their son had suffered similar, similar fate. Well, how did you, who told you about all this? How did they know that he was beaten to death? How did you know? That we learned, uh, the family, the parents of my cousin were notified that he had passed away and that the ashes would, could be uh, sent to the home. That he was beaten to death, we found out about uh, when those men who came back and saw it and could tell, talk about it to us, Jewish men who witnessed it. 
Eğer our concern was what's happening to my father. Well, my mother and I had the task of cleaning up the store. For two weeks, she and I tried to create order out of chaos, gather up masses of broken glass to the point where I still remember that at night I had trouble sleeping because I had the noise of broken glass in my ears. And friends and relatives come to the house and the talk is, how can we get out? What's happening to the men? No country wanted us, but then, and this is all in a matter of days, we learn that some countries might take children. England said we take 10,000. France, Holland, Belgium, Switzerland also would take some. My mother puts my name on the list for all of those. My friend Leo, on the 7th of December, barely one month after the start of the program, I bid him goodbye at the Wiesbaden Railroad Station. He's traveling to Amsterdam. He has relatives in Holland. I envy him that he got out. And a couple of days, and, and by the middle of December, some of the men come back from the camps. I was sent to the railroad station because somehow we learned that a group of men were coming back from the camp and I was to see if my father was among them. He was not, but I remember a group of men getting off that train. They were businessmen, lawyers, doctors, middle-aged, most of them. And to see them now, emaciated, dirty, uh, a, a view, hard to imagine, and difficult to forget. Well, a few days later, I was helping out at the Jewish community with some errands. We learned my father is back. By the time I come home to welcome him, he has cleaned up and seems to be in relative good shape. He always was very sporty and uh, in good physical shape and somehow managed to cope with the harassment, uh, starvation, the mistreatment that he had to endure in Dachau. How could he come back? Well, he had been a soldier, German soldier in World War I, and that gave him some preference to be released. He also had to declare that he would leave Germany as soon as possible. Were you surprised to see him alive? No, I was hoping and I was happy he was back. How did, how did, um, can, you, can you talk about the first time you saw him? Where was it? How did he come? How, what was the response? What was the, the meeting like? Yeah, we hugged each other and uh, uh, a tremendous sense of relief for me to see him and not 
uh, dirty or like I'd seen the other men because in the meantime he had been home for a couple of hours and looked almost like his normal self. Still, how can we get out? Where can we go? The children transports are starting and all of a sudden we get a letter from a distant relative in Sweden. She is a teacher at a Jewish boarding school and Sweden had declared its willingness to take 500 Jewish children. This was done uh, at the initiative of the small Jewish community in Stockholm. Sweden had about 6,000 Jews and they had to, of course, financially guarantee everything. And that where do you put those 500 kids? And that school, that Jewish boarding school had to take I think 30 of them. And this relative put my name among those 30. And two days later, by now it's middle of December, we get a letter from the Swedish embassy in Berlin, Germany's capital, that um, they have a reason for me. That automatically removes my name from any other children's list to any other country. And obviously now Sweden is my destination and my destiny. Well, can you, can you tell uh, the viewers, the people that watch us right now, what was the situation in Sweden regarding the Nazi occupation, the war? What were their policy? against this the war hadn't started yet this was in in december january of 1938 uh, i got there in early january which i'm going to mention to you and it's what life in sweden and its position during the war is also i like to talk about in a few minutes okay. All right. my father and i visit the relatives on the countryside to bid goodbye. My belongings get packed and shipped ahead. They get packed under the supervision and inspection of the police to make sure that all I take along are used objects, used clothing, and uh, that I don't take along anything of no money and nothing of value. We come back to, after visiting the relatives and bidding them goodbye, it was a sad visit. My uncles had come back from the camps, the businesses destroyed, the talk about how to survive, how to get out. How do I get to Sweden? To England, they had organized train trips. But we hadn't heard anything how to, if I had to attend, if I had to be in a transport or otherwise. My father, by now, found out that there was, uh, in the suburbs of Eastbound, a large chemical factory and the executive, chief executive, German, was an honorary consul for Sweden. We get an appointment, we go there. My father tries to get some information. The man is polite and he tells my father, don't wait for any transport. Put your son on a train and get him out. It was good advice. On the 9th of January, 1939, I bid my parents goodbye. They take me to the train station in East Baden. A few words of encouragement, of hope to, for a early reunion. And off I am. I'm now 30, just turned 13 years old. 
on this seven hour train ride from Wiesbaden to Berlin. I'm being met there by a cousin. Following day, we go to the Swedish embassy. And after a few days of paperwork, I get my visa. On the 15th of January, just two months after the start of the pogrom, I board the train in Berlin. It takes me through Northern Germany to the Baltic Sea. From there, the train goes on a ferry and gets carried to the south, south of Sweden. My last impressions on the train traveling through Northern Germany was, if you left Germany, you were allowed to take along the equivalent of $5. But there was a question in our mind if I as a child was entitled to that. So my cousin who had taken me to the train station said, why don't you just spend the money? I went to the dining car, had a meal. For the remaining money, I bought some chocolate. And now I was in the possession of total sum of the equivalent of 10 cents, traveling to a foreign country. It didn't bother me. Now a Border police, German, in black uniform, again, secret police, Gestapo, comes and inspects my little suitcase that I had taken for my personal overnight things. I had gotten a last minute gift of a book. He looks at it, he says, that's not allowed, he took it. I couldn't care less as long as I get out. Finally, the train, Beaches, the Baltic, first time I see an ocean. Train gets on the ferry. Slowly, the ferry starts moving. I see the German coastline disappearing on this slightly foggy January afternoon. And I remember I had a tremendous sense of relief knowing that I no longer was in Germany, where now it was a crime to be Jewish. I get to Sweden, it's a short train ride to my destination. I'm being met and taken to the boarding school. It's bunch of kids there that I spent the next couple of years with. We were about 60 children, similar background as like mine. We became family. And many of those kids were state friends from our lifetime. Among those children was a girl who 10 years later became my wife. And with that common background and history, uh, we had in incentive to start new lives. Anyhow, that I got there in January of 1939. September that year, Germany invades Poland. World War II has started. Shortly afterwards, that home gets dissolved. I come to another children's home and start attending Swedish high school, which I did for two years until I was 16. 
Now, how did I stay in touch with my family? There was no modern today's ways of communicating. We wrote letters every week. I would get a letter from them and I would write to them. When the war started in September of that year, mail was being censored by the Germans. And if anything was written, that was not to the liking of the Nazi people controlling it, it was blacked out. But the mail kept functioning. Sweden was not occupied. It was a neutral country. And the Germans with their obsession for law and order and regulations observed international postal regulations. So I was able to stay in touch. At the age of 16, in the summer of 1942, I finished the Swedish high school at that level. I wanted to continue towards three more years of studying, which would get me to a level where I could enter the university, but there were no funds for me to do that. So I moved to Stockholm, went to work, and started going to night school. And also in that summer of 1942, we learned that Jews still remaining in Germany are being deported to camps in Eastern Europe. By now, the war has led to the point where Germany controls most of Europe. Except for England, which held out during the Blitz of 1940. That gave us hope. And more things happened. In June of 41, Germany invades the Soviet Union. Instant success, it appears. And later that year, in December, I was now in a children's home. One of the adults comes late at night and tells us boys, we were boys, eight or 10 boys in a room. It was the evening of December 7th. Japan has attacked the United States. It gave us hope and relief. Now the Nazis not only were faced with the British Empire, and the vast Soviet Union, but now also with the endless resources of the United States. It gave us hope that they couldn't win. Unfortunately, it still lasted three and a half years until the bitter end. In the summer of that year, 1942, my parents write that it's now their turn that they have to leave East Berlin. They don't know for sure where they are being sent, maybe to Theresienstadt in the Czech, what's now the Czech Republic. And they also feared that they would not be able to stay in contact with me. So until 1942, your parents were in... In Wiesbaden, still in their apartment. 
Wow. They had severe restrictions. In 1941, they had to stop wearing the Jewish yellow star, and life became more and more difficult. And Paul, but, how did you, what was the, um, how did you were treated in Sweden? Did you suffer from any anti-Semitic? No. Um, nothing? I wouldn't say nothing. I mean, there was a Nazi party, but Sweden was a democracy. Uh, we were uh, limited in some of the places where we could live. Uh, I remember I was invited to join a family. Uh, they lived near the Norwegian border, but I was 17 at that time and considered maybe a risk uh, to, leave, to be that close to a uh, border to occupied Norway. And I could get, could come to Stockholm. And I lived there from 1942 until 1948. Now, what I did after I knew that my parents had left, been forced to leave East Berlin, I wrote to, to Reisenstadt a separate cards, registered mail with return receipt, separate cards to my mother, to my father, to my grandmother. And again, Within days, I get the receipts back with a signature and even indicating their address in Theresienstadt. They could send me short letters and received whatever mail I sent to them. This, this was from September, on September 1942. But in early 1943, <clears throat> I get my letters to them are uh, being returned with a big stamp that the person to whom the letter is addressed has left the reason that is no longer there. I knew that that was bad news because the reason that was sort of a collection, a ghetto. And as it became more crowded, uh, transports went from there to the extermination camps in Poland. Later on, I found out that the transport where my parents were on had left Theresienstadt in late January. And upon arrival, at Auschwitz in southern Poland, everybody on that transport was immediately murdered by being sent to the gas chambers. My grandmother stayed on in Theresienstadt for another year. I even could send her small packages and she could acknowledge them by mail. But in May of 1944, one year before the end of the war, she died there of presumably starvation and uh, unspeakable living conditions. And it was in a way it was a blessing because she would have been sent also to Auschwitz not many days later is all I found out later. We watched the events of the war. We were happy when Stalingrad became a big defeat for the Nazis. We were happy to learn that a thousand planes had been sent from England to Bonn, Köln, or Essen. And more than a thousand planes had practically destroyed the city of Hamburg. We watched the fall of 
Mussolini and the invasion in Normandy in early 1944, it was June of 1944. We knew that it was only a question of time until the ultimate defeat of the Nazis. But we also were aware that the killing went on undisturbed until the last moment. I had mentioned earlier that my friend Leo Kahn had been fortunate to get to Holland. Well, he was not that fortunate. He, his last address was Labour Camp Birkenau near Auschwitz. I wrote to him and my card came back with a stamp Concentration camp refuses acceptance of mail. After the war, I learned that he had gotten there in the spring of 1942 from Holland and that he had died there four months later. Uh, I still. How did you find out? They kept records in Auschwitz. in the early time. Later on, they did not, but in 1942, they did. And those records were found and ultimately you know, communicated to the world. Uh, for me to imagine how those last four months of his life in Auschwitz were until his final murder, it's something that I still grieve today. As I grieve for, but I always mention that among the 6 million Jews murdered by the Nazis, that there were 1,500,000 children. I was lucky. I was not one of them. I was among the maybe 20,000 or so who managed to get out under this kinder transport program. I lived in Stockholm. The war ended finally in May of 1945. I, at the time, worked at the Jewish community. And we, our task was to work to help survivors from the camps. Sweden took in, uh, I think, 40,000 concentration camp survivors, mostly young women. And they were put into hospitals to recover and for rehabilitation. And we Jewish young, young people uh, visited them and helped them to slowly but surely regain a normal life. As a matter of fact, I worked at that time in the Jewish community, helping them to establish contact for if they had any relatives in the uh, United States or in Palestine or other countries, if there were any relatives that they ultimately could join. And fortunately, in many cases, we were successful. You are very for fortunate, Paul. Very fortunate to, yes. uh, and I just want to want to indicate that uh, for people who wants to um, read the memoir that you wrote, there's a there's a book called "My Early Life in Germany in Sweden" by Paul Kester, and you can uh, find it online on Amazon. You can buy it on, on a uh, online or in other formats. So um, please go and check this book. I already started reading it, so. Just want to emphasize that. As you said, I was fortunate. I was lucky. I was lucky that my parents were willing to let their children depart, not knowing if they would ever see them again. I was lucky that I came to Sweden, a neutral country, not occupied by the Nazis. I was lucky that Hitler lost the war 
It assured my survival. And I was lucky that I had good genes and uh, always positive attitude and the desire to study and to improve myself. And as a matter of fact, in 1948, even though I felt at home in Sweden by that time, I made the decision to come to this country. And for the last 70 some years, I've lived here in Los Angeles. I had a wonderful marriage. My wife died a few years ago. I got reunited here with my sister. And I have a son and grandchildren, two granddaughters. And life has been good. There have been great years. I had a successful professional career. And looking back, I can say, uh, whereas my early life was impacted by external events, uh, the bulk of my life, most of my life, was what I considered normal, successful, happy, and I'm thankful for that. And I do speak quite often to young people, students, both in this country, and I've also done it quite a few times in Germany. And I'd always like to leave a message. And that is, don't hate. Be tolerant, fight intolerance, fight anti-Semitism. It's an evil sickness that I witnessed as a child, and it still exists, and it still has to be fought. And I appeal to the young people, those who are going to be the citizens of the 21st century, to preserve the dignity of man. It makes no difference what accent you have, what ethnic background you have, uh, what family background. A human being deserves the respect and the tolerance from everyone around them. That's what I tell the young people. I wish them well, and I hope none of them ever will be subjected now or in, at any time in their lives, this persecution and discrimination. Well, Paul, your message was very clear, very important, and that's why we're here to, to for other people, for the young generation to see it, and for non-Jews to, to hear your testimony. And, and I, can't be, I can't be more thankful for you to share your story. And, and if you want, again, if you want to know more details and more in-depth uh, stories, you can um, um, purchase the, the book, Memories, My Early Year, My Early Life in Germany and Sweden by Paul Kester. I have two, two last questions I wanna ask you. Yes. And that's um, something no one talks about because it's kind of like um, taboo or, or used to be taboo. You know, my grandparents were Holocaust survivors and my grandma suffered from uh, post-trauma from the Holocaust. She had all those nightmares. And um, how did you personally dealt with all this trauma this huge baggage that you carried as a kid in your adult lifehood in los angeles that's the first question second question is you could decide you would you know why not israel you decided the u.s why not going to the holy land and that's something i want to hear from you okay uh let's go to the second question first The youngsters that I grew up with in Sweden, I would say uh, half of them went to Palestine and ultimately Israel. I have 
but family connections I had were in the United States. I also had traveled in 1946, visited the United States. I liked what I saw. I liked the lifestyle here, the informality, especially in those days in Los Angeles. And I knew that, whereas I recognized the desirability and the necessity of a Jewish state, uh, I also knew that it would be, uh, at, in those years, a good part, part of communal living, of uh, hardship to make a living and to adjust to life in Palestine. And uh, since it was, my connections were just more geared to come to this country. I do support Jewish causes. I do support Israel uh, extensively. I'm a member of a foundation where we support Israel and especially fight anti-Semitism. And it's now, especially in my older age, a major part of my life. Coming back to the other question, how did I deal with the trauma? Uh, I had the benefit of being young at the time. Uh, young people look ahead. Uh, there was a uh, I was, I pushed myself to recreate a normal life. And I did it together with my wife. And we were successful in many ways, emotionally too. We never forgot our background. We have one son, only child. He is now retired, but he lives in Buffalo, New York. That's where he worked many years as a physicist. He's very active in the uh, Jewish community. He has traveled throughout Eastern Europe. My story or the story of my family, of my relatives, and we know who wound up in what camp he has visited at all. He has talked about it, written about it, and it's as much of his DNA as it is, as it is of mine. It has not impacted me in terms of uh, daily life. I was very, uh, I led a very active professional life. I was a CPA, joined us first a large, uh, well, I went to work <clears throat> at different jobs in the beginning, but uh, after the first five years, I wound up with a small firm uh, of about three people. We were able to take advantage of the growth of Southern California. We became a very large firm. It absorbed my daily life. We worked hard, we worked smart, but it was stimulating and rewarding. And I still today have social contacts with clients, at least those who are still alive. There are many left of my generation, but it's. Uh, The demands and the opportunities and the benefits of living here 
made it possible for us to be like any other family. And as I said before, uh, to have the drive as a young person to create a new life in a new country. And Los Angeles, especially in those days, was a new country. Uh, that, that made it, that helped. We never forgot where we came from. And my wife uh, lost her mother at Auschwitz. But she had also some siblings who survived and who also came to this country. So we had family and a wonderful professional and social life for many years. And I'm thankful for what has been. And I welcome the opportunity to talk about my past, which was not discussed so much in the early years, nor was it dealt with in Germany. Uh, as a point of interest, it was in about 1990 that I was contacted by teachers at the school that I, the school that I had attended in Wiesbaden and where I had been expelled, trying to find out what had happened to the Jewish students. They were writing a book about education. This is 1990, about education during the Nazi era at that school. Well, to make a long story short, I contributed to that book. And it also so happened that I was there at its publication. And it was the first time that I addressed German students. And ever since I've been talking to them and I've been talking here. And it was rewarding to get the questions of German students born 50 years after the war and to be able to talk to them and discuss things. And to get a question like, do you think that we are guilty? How do you answer that? You are not guilty what happened during the lifetime of your grandparents or more likely great grandparents, but you have an obligation to know the history of your country. And they're being taught that in Germany and to make sure that it doesn't happen again and that you protect and cherish the freedom and democracy and well-being that you enjoy there as we do here. Did you ever go back to Sweden or your hometown in Germany? Many times. Yeah? Yes. How was it? Different at different times. Sweden was, you know, visiting where, where I could say where I went to my school. In Germany, I went as early as 1947. I saw cities race. I went on international train from Copenhagen to Amsterdam. And we traveled through Hamburg and other German cities and miles and miles of rubble. Germans begging for it was from the international travelers on that train for something to eat, for something to smoke. I visited an uncle who had survived. I went to Wiesbaden. With a police official, I went to the apartment where we had lived, that was not easy. The then tenants were not happy to see me. The feeling was mutual, but we took inventory. I still recognize 
the chairs, the beds, the carpets, the cupboards, you name it, that my family had left on their final trip in 1942. It was still there in 1947. I could not at deal with any German because I would not know where was he or she two or three or four years earlier. Subsequent trips, I would say, starting with the late 60s, I could see the young people, new generation, and a new society, the old timers were disappearing, were dying out, and the feeling of disgust and hate, I did not think in those terms anymore to the people that now are the Germans. In Sweden, we always had emotional uh, attachments, friends that stayed there, uh, teachers that we visited. Those were always uh, fun trips. As a matter of fact, I was as recently as two years ago in Sweden and Germany. And I also at that time in Germany, I was in Wiesbaden and spoke at three high schools in one adult venue. So, um, and it's easy to do now because the past is history, even though it's personal history, but it doesn't relate to people or the society as it is today. Well, Paul, I wanted to thank you so much for um you know give us a little bit of um in into your personal story um your message is very important and very strong um i i wish i we had more time to discuss um you know music and how the music as as joy and solace uh for you in your life but if you could uh recommend us to listen to one piece uh, of the music that influenced you in Sweden when you, when you or, or later on, one piece of music, one piece of uh, creation, what would it be? Can you pick Mozart or? It, it would be, what still moves me today is, uh... Uh, probably Beethoven's Ninth Symphony and its message that it conveys. Uh, basically, I mean, the music is very powerful and the message is all human beings are brothers and sisters. And, and so that would be my first choice, but there are other many other pieces that I listen to still today and cherish and has been part of our life. So we will listen to it and I recommend everyone to um, uh, log in to the LA Phil, Philharmonic. Uh, Paul has his uh, all-time favorites. Um, in the LA Phil, there's a special in lafield.com. Uh, you can find Paul favored um, pieces of, of classical music that he, that influence him, that inspire him, that he loves personally. So um, I would love to uh, talk to you more and I will, we'll be in touch, but um, we have to wrap up for now. Yeah. And, and thank you so much for this time and your um, inspiring story and who you are, you know, inspiring.
very emotional. Well, thank you. Uh, I welcome the opportunity to talk with you and hope to maybe we can do it another time too. For sure. Stay well, stay safe, and um, we'll talk very soon. And thank you, everyone who uh, joined us to this talk with Paul. Thank you so much, Paul.